So it's on a greater uh, scale, the universe is like this, that behind every movement, behind every planet, behind every season, that there are personalities governing over the entire situation. Some of these personalities are, could, could be considered more elevated in the sense that they're uh, very much enlightened and they have extreme, extremely high potencies, like, for example, the sun god, the power, the personality who controls the movements of the sun, that uh, he has a very heavy task. It goes on for so many millions and billions of years. He can never deviate from his orbit. He's providing the entire universe with heat and light for the sustenance of all living entities. So he has to be a very extraordinarily elevated being in order to do this. This, uh, this leads us to another point that the idea that in the past that any ancient society that worshipped the sun or moon, etc., they're automatically a polytheistic society with many gods, this is an absolutely falsified claim. It may have become degraded into that at different points as the Kali Yuga began 5,000 years ago, but actually in all ancient cultures, the worship and the sun and moon indicated the worship of the power behind the sun and the moon, which was the one supreme creator of all that be, the supreme godhead. So this is another extraordinary difference between modern archaeological thought and the actual facts of the ancient past is that uh, any time a society is seen to have paid any respect to the sun or moon or any other type of demigod, they're automatically condemned as some kind of, uh, you know, many gods, just like the Hindu religion is also often mis misinterpreted in that way that there are so many different gods and it's polytheistic and that there's kind of a... Uh, a competition for who will be the supreme god but in the case in that case and in the case with many other ancient cultures the actually the honoring and the worship of demigods was because they were actually worshiping the power behind the demigods who is the supreme lord so uh this is another important important point to be made that uh ancient civilizations understood that there was one supreme being behind everything and actually in the Vedic literatures, uh, we learned from this chapter that in the ultimate issue, we call the Supreme Creator Godhead. Not just God, but Godhead, because there's more than one personality. And in the ultimate issue, there is a male and female. It's actually Godhead is a divine couple. And it can be seen just like in this world, in order to create, there has to be male and female. So as we go up the fractal scale universally in the ultimate issue that the uh, ultimate Godhead, the source of everything that be, is both a male and female personalities. It's just like one example might be the, uh, the electrical powerhouse. The electrical powerhouse is sitting in one spot, but the power is transmitted through the transmission lines. So the male aspect of the Godhead may be considered to be like the powerhouse, but in the female aspect may be considered to be like the transmission lines that take that power and distribute it throughout the, all the spiritual and material universes. So w the powerhouse without the transmission lines is useless. No one can receive the power. No one can derive any benefit from the power. And the transmission lines without the powerhouse is also useless because there's no source of energy to be transmitted over the lines. So it takes the coupling of both the powerhouse and the system of transmission in order to spread the creative energies universally. This is one thing we learned from the Vedic literatures. I think it's very unique, and people of other religions can take example from this, but that the ultimate uh, fact is that the supreme personalities of Godhead, there is a male and female aspect. So one thing is people often say uh, about, well, people are talking a lot, especially in the alternative research communities, and they're bringing forth a lot of problems and a lot of ideas, but there aren't any solutions. So in the chapter that we discussed last week, there are solutions that were given forth as to the current problems of mankind. Four of the solutions that were given were austerity, mercy, 
cleanliness, and truthfulness. Those are considered to be the four legs or the four pillars of righteousness, which were represented by the legs of the cow and bull. So we can see that today we've gotten away from a lot of these things. For example, all the slaughter of all the animals, that there's no mercy anymore. And we also see this become reflected in the human society because of the psychological damage done by slaughtering animals that becomes reflected in our actions towards each other. We can see that there's a lot of violence, a lot of war, a lot of crime, a lot of dissent within the family. Many things like that are going on nowadays because of the loss of mercy. We also see that there's a loss of austerity nowadays in that the frantic materialistic race of, in most societies is to gather more and more material possessions and more and more goods and more and more comfort and the very idea of austerity uh, people flee from that idea and all anyone is seeking really in the materialistic society without any spiritual knowledge is as much comfort as they can get we often see that even with extremely rich people or people that have everything that no matter how much they collect and no much how much they gather, how many homes and cars that they have, that there's still something missing in their life and they're not really happy. And even sometimes they may commit suicide or become drug addicted because this proves that austerity is an important feature uh, in our lives. Now, this is not some kind of uh, false austerity, but the austerity is more getting at to save some time for contemplation, to save some time for spiritual uh, readings to try to put a, set aside some of your, part of your life to understand higher principles. So it's not the kind of austerity where you know maybe in the old days they would go out and flog themselves or or do different things like that to try to create a sense of pain or torment. It's not that kind of austerity. The austerity means sacrificing some time for the higher goals of life and to try to transmit that to the others in your world that after you go within yourself and you spend some time meditating and reading and thinking and studying ancient knowledge that you come out and you discuss with other people in your world the realizations that you've had uh, in regards to that and also there's the aspect of cleanliness and truthfulness now the last leg of religion is truthfulness so we may not be able to do very perfectly austerity mercy or cleanliness in this age but the one thing that we can do per perfectly is to be truthful to one another. And we see that that's a big problem today, especially in the modern political world, that there always seems to be some kind of lie going on or some kind of bribery or nepotism. And that, you know, this is the one thing that we can succeed at perfectly in this age is to keep our truthfulness intact, to be honest with one another, and to not be deceitful in our dealings with others. But even we see that in this age, that's also become very difficult. But it's a good starting point uh, as far as solutions to our problems of the current day affairs, that both in our personal and societal dealings, to be truthful with one another. Okay, I wanted to discuss a few other points that we had learned from the chapters that we were reading last week in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And one of the main points that we learned last week is that there are two types of knowledge. There is ascending knowledge and descending knowledge. Now, ascending knowledge might be considered to be the scientific method whereby different theories are created, then they're tested by hypothesis and experimentation to see if they're true. And descending knowledge is more the type of knowledge that we're gathering here in the study of ancient scripture, ancient knowledge, that the knowledge is coming down from masters and perfected beings through their... Uh, through lines of different teachers and that knowledge is coming down perfectly intact as it is and when we say spiritual masters we mean people that have mastered the knowledge people that have proven that they have progressed on the path of self-realization and are acting in ways that reflect austerity mercy cleanliness and truthfulness so that there's a test involved just like the scientific method the ascending process that the hypothesis has to be uh, tested by experimentation. So in the same way, descending knowledge is also scientific in that we can test it in 
our own world and our own life and that if we put this knowledge into practice, are we feeling more peaceful? Are we feeling more happy? Are we feeling more progressive on the path of realization? And we can also see in the so-called masters of the current world that there's a lot, of t a lot of cheating going on and that sometimes the people who call themselves masters are the most agitated, the most lost, the most foolish, the most greedy. So in the same way we can test the ancient masters and the knowledge of their lives and the biographies and histories of their lives to see how they've acted. In that is a kind of scientific proof that they've progressed on the path and can transmit this knowledge perfectly. The ascending method, or the method of gathering some knowledge, testing it by different hypotheses and experimentation, it has several problems. The first is that the living entities commit mistakes. The second is that we're often delusioned. The third is that we have a tendency to cheat. And the fourth is that we're limited by imperfect senses. I think the fourth of these problems with the ascending type of knowledge is something that I can speak to. Um, for example, there's the von Heisenberg uncertainty principle which states that well, this was throwing them off in the early days of nuclear experimentation, that their results were often skewed from what they were expecting or the results weren't making sense. And finally, von Heisenberg, he discovered that the thing that we're not taking into account is that it takes some time for the light to bounce off whatever it is we're observing. It takes some time for it to, re to transmit to whatever device we're using to measure. Uh, the experiment that we're looking at and in our day-to-day -day world this doesn't make a vast difference that it's taking some time for the light to bounce off whatever we're looking at and then go into the receptacles of our eyes be transmitted through our nervous system collated by the brain and then we understand what the images and the sounds and the smells and taste etc that we're experiencing in this world what what sense they're making but on the subatomic level this delay was actually very, very important. And it points out that with our current senses or whatever device that we create to observe the world around us, we can never even really observe reality as it's happening. There is a time delay between the time it takes for the light to bounce off whatever we're looking at and whatever receiver that we're using, whether it be our own senses or some device that we've created in order to measure what's going on, that there's, uh, that inherently, on an inherent level, that there's an imperfection there, that we can't ever observe reality actually as it's happening. Of course, there's so much other limitations that people have tried to create uh, different instruments and technologies to overcome. For example, you know, mankind has learned that there are so many frequencies of light that our eyes cannot receive. There's infrared, ultraviolet, gamma rays, x-rays, so many different forms of electromagnetic frequencies that we can't see. And we've tried to create different devices uh, in order to compensate for that. And it goes on and on like that. So there's, in the ascending process, the tendency is to always be wrong because the limitations of our senses, the tendency to cheat, the tendency to be illusioned, and the tendency to commit mistakes. Whereas the descending knowledge, if it's actually coming, the original source is actually the Supreme Personalities of Godhead, is coming down in a direct line of teachers, that that knowledge is perfect as far as the nature and structure of the universe, how we relate to that universe, what is the ultimate goal of life, all these things in a descending type of knowledge can actually be ascertained and they can be ascertained much more quickly because we don't have to go through so much experimentation, so much time consuming uh, experiments and hypotheses that actually we can learn very quickly uh, what is happening from the line of descendant masters.